Uh, yeah, just going to go through uh, a few things on hydraulic fracturing and mostly about some of the history here in, in the UK. And again, it's very short, so it'll be mostly open for questions more, more than trying to show a lot on here. Uh, a lot of the stuff that shows up in the media, uh, certainly the people in the industry, sometimes find it humorous, some of the things that show up in the, in the newspapers and, and things like that. Uh, one of the things that I think is really common is you see these pictures are there, you know, from the Gazette, uh, the Guardian, uh, Mail, and every one of them say something about hydraulic fracturing. Is the hydro hydro hydraulic fracturing kit or the hydraulic fracturing plant, and they show all that. None of that is hydraulic fracturing. All of those, or basically it's all the same picture, it's all a, a drilling rig. Not only is it just a drilling rig, it, it's kind of a specific type of drilling rig. Uh, so every time you've seen something like that and the article talks about hydraulic fracturing, there's a little bit of disconnect there. Uh, one of the presentations yesterday was talked for 20 minutes on hydraulic fracturing, never showed anything on hydraulic fracturing, it was always drill rigs. And uh, so that, that's our rig that we use, that's the one, I think that rig's been in more pictures around the world in the last couple of years than uh, anybody. I, I met a, a man that uh, worked on a drilling rig for 30 years a few weeks ago and uh, uh, he complained to me that he'd always thought he, he was a, a driller and just recently he's found out that he's been working in fracking his whole life. And he's never, he's never been on a, never been on a frac, frac ever. Uh, yeah, this is actually a, 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 a hydraulic fracture treatment here. This was uh, the priest hall well. Uh, I think I got another picture here in a little bit that I can show what some of the stuff is. This is a hydraulic fracture. You, know, you should see a picture like this. This is a Halliburton doing one of the first shale fracks in Poland. And uh, uh, this is a, a, a picture from North America. Uh, so I think you see a lot in the news. Uh, you can't frack or you can't do stuff in, in Europe because the only place they do it is in North America in the middle of nowhere. There's nothing but cactus and jackrabbits around. Uh, obviously, th this is in, in Texas. This is in the, the Barnett Shale. Uh, so if you actually look at the county that, that, the, that the Barnett started in, Tarrant County, Texas, it has a higher population density than Lancashire. There's, I think there's like almost one and a half times as many people in this county, and I think the last count I saw, there was a little over 7,000 wells drilled there. Uh, of course, they're all not you know, in the middle of the town like that, but uh, I mean, that's a, a frack operation. Uh, obviously, you can see it's, it's uh, you know, not out in the middle of, of nowhere. And uh, uh, again, this, this is the, the Priest Hall frack. What, what makes a frack when you're actually doing a treatment as you can see, the, the different equipment here. All this stuff over here uh, is just tanks of water. So that's the water tanks. Uh, up here in the corner is a connection to the mains. So we have a, a mains connection on the site, which reduces all the truck traffic so you don't have as many trucks. Uh, in North America, a lot of times, instead of having tanks, is they, they build a large pond and, and line the pond with fresh water, the freshwater pond. Now, you know, here, you, you don't do that here. Every, everything goes in a steel tank. Uh, these little bits of equipment over here, uh, those are the pumps. That's what actually pumps the water, builds up enough pressure to crack the rock. Uh, the wellhead itself is, is over here. Uh, the various other tanks and equipment are, or, are to handle the flowback water. When the water comes back, uh, you have different type of separator that separates the gas and the water and any sand that comes back or if there's oil in an oil well it separates the water and the oil and all that uh, for for shale type work to reduce uh, uh, fugitive emissions you run a, a, a different type of separator a bigger separator so you can bring the, the, the water the flow back water through and separate the gas out sooner uh, a lot of practices in the states, especially in the early days, is, is they wouldn't run a big separator like that, so they would flow back and, and either vent or flare the gas for a long time just to, at, just to let, let it go to atmosphere. So a lot more, they couldn't flare it because it, it was, uh, uh, still had too high a water, and they would just let that vent off, and that's where a lot of the fugitive emission uh, information came from. But now, you know, a modern system, or I'd say not modern, in the last few years, the, the green systems, uh, you're, you're capturing all that so you can either send it to a pipeline or a generator or, or to a, uh, you know, if you're in an exploration area, you know, you can flare it instead of venting it, which of course is a lot better for, uh, uh, for the atmosphere. 
So in the UK, you've been fracking in the UK for a long time. It's not something new. You know, you see that a lot in the in the media and the press. How new it is and how how you know the regulators aren't aware of it in this. Uh, it's been going on for a long time here. This is one of the first jobs I did in the UK uh, back in 1992. It's a very similar job to what we did recently. It was a, a large, multi-stage, uh, uh, you, know, you know, several fracks on one well. Uh, uh, you know, back at, you know, back then that was in uh, just outside of Chester. And uh, I think, you know, the last count I, heard, I saw from Deck was a little over 200 wells. Uh, that, that have been done you know, onshore in the UK, and of course offshore they do many times more of that. There's several large, basically they call them frack boats that, that go around the North Sea, go to the different platforms, and do hydraulic fracturing offshore. Uh, at one time, the North Sea held the record for the largest frack in the world, and it was done offshore. And uh, uh, a little note there: the the Ellswick one is in the middle of the license, the shale license in uh, uh, in Lancashire, and uh, we did a frack on that back in 1993. I used to work for a company that had a bunch of red equipment. And, uh, there's another frack in the, in, in the UK, it was onshore, uh, that's in the middle of the fertilizer plant. You talked about, uh, one of the people yesterday was talking about the grow how. Uh, you know, one of the major feedstocks for fertilizer is, is natural gas. And uh, so back then they were actually trying to get a gas well to work basically within the plant. Uh, it didn't produce enough to be commercial, but uh, that was another, another uh, frack on shore here. Uh, uh, th this one is interesting. It was, it, again, this is back in the early 90s uh, when I first, first came over and you talk about, uh, a lot of people talk about the chemicals and you see all the time there's 500 or 1,000 chemicals that are used on a frack job. And uh, it, it's probably true, there probably are 500 chemicals but those are how many chemicals are available. That's not how many chemicals that you use on a job. Uh, you know, typically on a on a on a, a frack, you might only use three or four on, on the jobs that we that we did here for uh, a shell well. Here we really only used one, and uh, uh, this particular job was down in West Sussex. They originally they did a, a normal sand frack, what people would think is a sand frack, uh, like like we do on some of the shale wells. That wasn't commercial. And they uh, basically did an experiment on it, and we fracked. I think they used a little over 13 or 1400 barrels of fluid, but it was basically marmite and sugar. And so, like all these little brown things on the ground here, that's, those are tubs of marmite. Off, off to the side of the picture, there were truckloads of these little tubs. And also, if you look off to the side, there's a whole bunch of guys all covered in marmite because they had to scoop it out by hand and, and, and mix it in the water. This is the mixing equipment here. And then they brought, a, brought sugar in, in, and the sugar came in big one-ton sacks, but it had been in storage for too long, so it was like a big rock of sugar. So the guys all chipped on that for several hours. And uh, I think this is the, the guy here. He had some bacteria that ate the marmite and sugar and excreted hydrochloric acid. So this frack was an acid frack, but the acid was generated in, in situ in the rock. So it, uh, you know, when you look at the frack fluids and the various types of frack fluids, there's lots of different kinds over the years. I mean, the, the, the actual shale fracks that typically are done now are probably some of the most basic and simplest fluids that, that we use. And uh, I think. Uh, you know, a lot of times you talk, hear, hear things like, well, you know, we've been fracking since 1947, which is true, but now somehow the fracks on shale wells are different, that somehow it's different. This is a, 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 one of the first fracks that I was on back in 1981, it's in Ohio. It, it's the exact same jobs that we do now. It was, you know, there's a, there was a, a big uh, lake behind all those tanks, those are all tanks of water right there, and it was multi-stage. Uh, you know, several frocks on one well. Uh, it was just a big slick water frack. This is the exact same job that we do now. And it, it was a friction reducer, water, and sand. And that was in the Clinton Sandstone in Ohio uh, back in 1981. So the, the, the technology isn't new. Sometimes we apply it differently. Probably what the, the biggest difference between 1981 and doing a slick water frack and and today doing some of the, the fracks on a on a on a shale well, a horizontally drilled shale well, isn't the frack itself as different or the rock behaves different. The 
probably the difference is we do more fracks per well. Okay, where, where you drill a vertical well and do, uh, say, a single frack to, to contact it one layer of the rock, now we can drill a horizontal well and put a lot of fracks in that same rock. Where in the old days, we would have had to drill a whole bunch of vertical wells and you just can't get them close enough together. So a horizontal well just allows you to contact more rock with, uh, with the fracturing fluid. So the difference isn't the fracks are different or the rocks behave different or anything. It's just with a smaller surface print, we can contact more rock area because we can actually do more fracks underground and not have to drill as many wells from surface. And uh, uh, one of the other things, of course, was the, the drilling industry in the UK. This is just a chart of how many wells were drilled every year. Uh, it only goes back to 2000 on this one, but that carries on before that. But if you look somewhere, that's 30 right there. So give or take, somewhere 25, 30 wells a year have been drilled consistently for decades. So the onshore industry has been around for a long time. Uh, the regulators have been messing with this for a long time. They, 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 you know, they know what's going on. And of course, the offshore industry is, is uh, covered by a lot of the same stuff. So uh, again, that's some, that's a, the, the brief bit on fracking. And uh, uh, I'm sure if somebody has a question on some stuff, we can try and cover it. Eric, why is hydraulic fracturing so controversial? What makes it controversial? Well, is that, yeah. So uh, the, the fracturing process itself, again, has been, been around for, for decades. And, and even, even in the UK, we've done lots and lots. Uh, I think what makes it controversial right now is if you talk to some of the, the people that were here yesterday, and the goal is to not have, any, their goal is to not have any hydrocarbons. Leave them in the ground, right? So hydraulic fracturing kind of became the poster child for oil and gas drilling. I mean, you see all kinds of stuff you know, on, on the media or whatever. It doesn't have anything to do with hydraulic fracturing, but it gets called hydraulic fracturing. And uh, so fr hydraulic fracturing has suddenly become the, you know, drilling completion, you know, anything that's ever happened on a well suddenly relates to hydraulic fracturing. I mean, we did the, the paper that you were talking about yes, just this morning, where they had natural gas in the surface, and you said, you connected hydraulic fracturing to that, but if you actually go into any of those papers, none of them have anything to do with hydraulic fracturing. It's all well construction. It has to do with how the well is constructed, which is independent of hydraulic fracturing. And uh, you, know, we, you know, we tried to change the name of hydraulic fracturing back in the 80s because frac somehow manages to get people's attention. It's a good emotive word. It, it works great for people that are that are that are trying to uh, uh, you know stir issues up and, and that type of thing. And uh, so I think that's where some of it came from. Tell me a little bit more about the process of the water that goes in and it, the stuff that comes out and what's left behind. Okay, so the, the basic process, what hydraulic fracturing actually is, is you're using some type of fluid to put enough pressure on the rock, you know, at depth to crack it. Okay, so that's the fracture part. The hydraulic part is, is being able to transmit that pressure. So we pump fluid, usually in, in the case of shale, excuse me, it's a water-based fluid, so water in there. You're trying to make some tiny cracks in the rock. Most of the cracks are pre-existing. You're trying to open pre-existing cracks. And in order to keep those cracks open, we put sand in. And, and then that way, after we've re stopped pumping, we, we've stopped creating the, the fractures, we want to let that pressure back out and let all the water out so the gas can flow. So some of that water will come back to surface. Basically, the crack squeezes back closed. They're you know, tiny, tiny cracks. But they, they squeeze closed, squish that water back out to surface, so some of that water comes back out. Uh, the majority of the water is actually trapped in the rock. The, you know, uh, on shales, it, it's actually trapped at a molecular level. It can't actually fit through the, the cracks. The water molecules are too big to fit through some of the holes. And uh, so a lot of that water stays there. The water that comes back, uh, call it flow back water, a lot of people talk about flow back water, and it picks up some of the minerals, especially salts, that are in the shales and brings those back to surface too. So when the water comes back, it brings back usually anything you put in it to go down. So like in, in our case, the, we put uh, polyacrylamide, it's a friction reducer, it's non-hazardous, so the fluid that went in was non-hazardous. <clears throat> when it comes back up, 
Sometimes it'll bring back some of the polyacrylamide. A lot of times the polyacrylamide actually bonds to the rock uh, and uh, chemical bond to the rock. So it, most of it tends to stay, but the water itself will come back. And again, it'll bring back the salts and that. So uh, you know, one of the issues, uh, especially here, is, is the uh, norm level, okay, the, radio, the radioactivity in the rock. So shale naturally has, has uh, you know, radioactivity in it, along with lots of other, other fluids or lots of other rocks. So that's one of the things that we deal with now. And I uh, actually brought a, a sample to, to kind of give an idea of what the permit level of radioactivity is. So if you took a liter of water, if I can get it out of my pocket. And this is a Brazil nut. So if you put two of these Brazil nuts and grind them up in a liter of water, you need a permit to dispose of it. That, that's the level that the radio had, the norm level for a permit. Okay? And uh, you know, the level changes as, as the, uh, as the uh, fluid comes back. So initially the fluid doesn't have many minerals in it, uh, and then the, 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 which is the higher volumes of fluid that come back. And then later on it has more and more minerals <clears throat> as it becomes concentrated, so it has a higher volume. I think the highest number we ever came up with is about 90 becquerels per liter, and the, the average was, is around 30, which is similar to the, actually some of the streams and stuff, that, that especially the ones that are coming down off the bowl and shale that are picking up bits of shale already. And uh, you know, so you know, we have to have a permit, you have to dispose of that properly, and basically all you're, all you're doing is sending it to a treatment facility that can, that can drop out those solids, because the solid itself doesn't need a permit. The radioactivity is actually lower than some of the background, like for dirt and, and, and ground. So basically you want to take the solids out, and that leaves the water that doesn't have any norm in it. So. Okay. Um, and Quadrilla in, in their fracture jobs um, last year, uh, only used one chemical. Can you tell us just a little bit more about that chemical and why you've only used one chemical? Okay, so in, in, in the fracks that we did on Crease Hall, we only used a polyacrylamide friction reducer. Uh, it's not exactly true that we only used one. We also put some salt in to, to, as a tracer, but it was like a hand, handful of salt. And then, uh, 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 but the main chemical was this polyacrylamide. Polyacrylamide is, uh, is just a polymer that's used to reduce the friction of the water going down the pipe. So if you can imagine the wells, you know, nine or 10,000 feet deep, and we're trying to push water through th that pipe at, uh, in, in that case, we were doing about 3,000 gallons a minute. We were trying to push the water through, and that generates friction pressure, just the water trying to push its way through that pipe. The polyacrylamide reduces about 70% of that friction, and that's really all it's in there for, is to require less of the equipment on surface. <clears throat> it allows you to have lower pressures on surface, and, and it just makes the, the, uh, the fluid slippery, so it can go down in the well easier. Uh, you, know, you know, from the marmite frack to you know, all the other fracks, there's all kinds of different fluids that you can use, but you traditionally, you're typically you want to use the simplest, most fluid that you have to, because one, chemicals cost money, you don't want to have to spend the money if you don't have to, and if there's no reason for it to be in the well, you don't need to run it. Now, in some shales, in some areas, you know, like in, in the, say in the U.S., and different shales run different types of fluids, uh, uh, and so they'll have different chemical bases on that. Uh, if in, in, in the shale here, you know, from the testing that we've done on the rocks, you don't have to run some of those other chemicals. Like one of the chemicals is to prevent scale. Uh, you know, if you have your, your kettle, or your shower at home, it gets scale on it over the time. The same thing happens on on uh, oil and gas wells. As the water is produced through the well, it'll build scale on the inside of the pipe, and so you can put something in there that prevents that from happening. So that's one of the chemicals that they run sometimes. And uh, but in 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 the test that we've done on the shale here, we haven't re needed that, so we haven't had to run it. Okay. Uh, one final question. Uh, a lot of discussion about water and the use of water, and particularly where <coughs> the industry is going to be working in the, in the south of England. Mm -hmm. um, how much water do you use, and is it a concern? Well, I mean, the, one, one of the kind of misconceptions on the water is a lot of people think that you use the water all the time for the life of the well. So when you do a, a hydraulic frac, say, say on a, on a producing or a, or a uh, production well, like the wells that we haven't drilled yet, a, a big horizontal, you do multiple fracks on that. Uh, a frac it can vary in size, say from say 800 to 1500 cubic meters per frac, and then 
depending on how long the horizontal is, how many times you'll do that per well. But that water usage is over a very short period. So you know, maybe a week or two weeks is how long it would take to, to do that frack, and then, then you're done with the water usage for that particular well. Now, you know, one of the other kind of issues with, with, uh, with uh, especially with shale gas and that, uh, your people are concerned about water usage, even though that doesn't, you know, it sounds like a lot in the big scheme of things. It, like to United Utilities where we get our water, you know, this is actually not enough. They'd like to sell us more. But uh, uh, <coughs> when you look at actually what the gas is used for, you know, say for power generation, and then you compare it to your other options, say nuclear or coal, it uses less water. Okay, so there's actually less water used to generate power from, from a shale gas type well than there is, like substantially less than say a coal plant or even less than the, the water that's required to process the material to get into a nuclear plant. So in the big scheme, it actually uses less water, but you know, from the local on the spot, it seems like it does seem like a lot, but but to the actual utilities, it it, it isn't uh, it isn't a draw. Okay. So. Um, questions from the audience. Gentleman there with the white shirt. <coughs> Morning, uh, Simon Green Total. Um, general opinion on the use of liquid propane uh, for fracturing. I mean, I've seen some of the jobs in that, and I know they've used it on, on various uh, plays in uh, North America. I, I, I don't, haven't seen enough actual wells that they've used it on for, you know, like a pure shale gas type development where it, where it made it a big enough difference to to go ahead with that. And you know, a lot of people will say, well, it's uh, you know, it's a you know, one of the reasons for using it is to reduce water usage, but if the water usage itself isn't a huge burden, if, if you're not in a desert climate or something like that, it, it you know it, it's far more expensive, and you know one of the, one of the issues is is would people feel more comfortable if I had tanks of water out there or truckloads of propane? So it, it it's uh, you know maybe for some of the oil reservoirs and stuff like that, and I certainly see a big use of it on uh, some of the conventional or more conventional traditional oil field uh, wells, some of the older wells, and, and going back in and doing work on some of those. Tough question. Gentleman here. Yeah, thank, uh, thanks very much, uh, Councillor Gordon McCann from uh, from Wyaburra, uh, once again. I've got to say, Quadrilla, in, in, in the area where you've actually been trying off on the, in, in the file, is uh, been very good at uh, educating people and I think quite honestly <laughs> Thank you. that is the key to the whole, the whole issue of fracking in Great Britain. You've got to tell people just exactly what's going on. And when you talk about flaring, if people don't know what you're doing but, and you put a big flare over a well, the people are going to be frightened. Yeah. And if you go to tell, you've got to tell people what to expect, and you've got to, and then if they know what to expect, then they're not going to object. Get, get your get your education in first, and I, and I think to alleviate most of the problems that you'll get by uh, RAF and uh, frack off and people like that who have been particularly active in the filed area, I suggest, and I think you probably know already, I oh, might yeah. be teaching my grandma to suck <laughs> eggs here, but you've got, to, you've got to get in there and educate people, because people aren't stupid. No. They, they know what the agenda of RAF and people like that are. They know what your agenda is, and they know what the benefits of, uh, of shale gas can be. So please, get in there and tell people. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another question? <coughs> Gentleman here. Yeah, uh, Glyn Williams, uh, E5V. Eric, in the States, I think there's been a fair amount of movement from the frac companies to get green on their fluids. Where do you think the opportunity lies more for the surface plant, you know, noise attenuation, dual fuel, you know, what improvements can we make um, in, in the surface uh, equipment? I mean, I think, I think certainly, and I think the, the U.S. is doing the same thing. You know, certainly uh, as you go into more, you know, proven reserves and proven fields. I mean, right now it's all exploration. We don't really know if it's, it's going to work. So it's you know, more of a temporary uh, uh, exploration stage. It's, you know, once it is going into development, then you can use 
you know, you know, everything from electric powered equipment, depending on where you are, to natural gas or, or dual fuel, as you say, you know, drill rigs and, and uh, the frac equipment to reduce emissions from the diesel engines. And, and obviously, like the sound attenuation, I think that's going to be one of the, the differences here, one of the issues here that we have to deal with uh, for hydraulic fracturing. When you, when you hydraulically fracture these wells in the States, there's basically a 24-hour operation. There's a lot of truck movements all the time. And, and you know, certainly for most of the sites here, I, I don't see that happening that way. I don't think you, you could actually uh, run the operations like that. Certainly from a noise standpoint, you can't emit that much noise. I think right now most of the frac equipment isn't sound attenuated, so you can only run it to you know, daylight hours like a normal construction site or something. Uh, you know, certainly for the future, you know, you'd, you'd want to bring those sound levels down more like the drill rig. Like now the drill rigs are all attenuated, so you can run 24-hour operations with that. Somewhere in the future, you know, we'll, we'd want to do that with uh, with the rest of the service equipment. I'll take one more question before moving on. Uh, John Findlay, Wyatt Brothers, Well Drillers. Um, a question for you both, really. Uh, I picked up yesterday from the Environment Agency that they are preventing any drilling in source protection zones. Um, so that's going to place quite a constraint on where you can actually drill, especially in the southeast. Um, just your comments on that. I think like, from, from the discussions we've had with the Environment Agency, with the, with the groundwater people, I mean, certainly in a, in a zone one, the, the closest area, there wouldn't be any additional drilling, but that's a fairly small area. The zones two and zone three just require different uh, permits. You have to have a permit to go through there, a water permit, and, uh, and, you, and you have to uh, uh, you know, maybe do more uh, environmental impact type work to make sure that you're not going to affect that. And of course, as you go out to a three, it's, it's a little bit less than a two. And then outside of that, of course, uh, you know, you're really not supposed to have to have a water permit at all to go through the through the water table. But I mean, you go to the the southeast and the, the southern UK, uh, you know, the the marmite the marmite frack that I was showing that was in West Sussex. You know, so I think I don't want to say most of the fracks, but certainly many of the fracks and and, and lots of the wells that are producing in the UK are, are already down there. They're already through all that. So I mean, it's it's common to be able to drill through through water tables and and, and if you build the wells correctly, which is, is the way the, the regulatory process is here, then uh, uh, you know it's it's not an issue. And it's the same for an oil and gas well or even a water well. I mean, water wells you know penetrate one aquifer to go to another. You know, there's been Thousands of mineral extraction wells. You know the, the British Coal Authority drilled. I don't know how many wells that went through all that. Uh, a geothermal well. The same. It's, it's the same process. The same uh, engineering that it takes to, dr to construct all those wells to, to be able to, to make them so that they they don't leak and they're and they're safe. 